Companies can engage in activities which result in the death of human beings, which you, if you engage in it, there'd be murder. But how do you put a corporation in jail for life? Hmm. Raise taxes on ah. their you can raise taxes on their products. You could raise taxes on their products. Yes. There is that. So, to look at this, follow the money. On October 20th, 1942, the U.S. Alien Property Custodian under the Trading with the Enemy Act seized the shares of a Union Banking Corporation of which Prescott Bush was an older owner, director, and shareholder. The largest shareholder was E. Roland Harriman. Bush was also the managing partner of Brown Brothers Harriman, a leading Wall Street investment firm. Prescott Bush and Herbert Walker, as in... George Herbert Walker Bush, it's neither their one grandson. It's neither one that brought all the oil originally from Saudi Arabia over here. Could be. Yeah, he was. Could be. I'd buy it. Among the company's finance was the Silesian American Corporation. Sleazy? Oh, mm -hmm. Silesian American Corporation, also managed by Prescott <coughs> Bush and his father-in-law, George Herbert Walker. The company was vital in supplying coal to Nazi war industry. It, too, was seized as a Nazi front on November 17, 1942. Largest company, Bush's UBC, helped finance was the German Steel Trust, responsible for one-third and one-half of Nazi iron and explosives. We are at war with the Germany, and a major American bank is doing business with Nazi Germany. With the full knowledge of the president. Naturally, how could he not know? UBC was established to send American capital, i.e. money, to Germany to finance the reorganization of its industry under the Nazis. Their leading German partner was the notorious Nazi industrialist Fritz Thyssen, who wrote a book admitting much of this called I Paid Hitler. Thyssen Company today makes, uh, well, electronics, elevators, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> there is a family resemblance. Hello. Right. Say. So, as the death camps were being built and people were being rounded up, who is going to be on the list? Which citizens are going to be on the list? Jews, blacks, homosexuals, gypsies. So, you may not know this, but 5,000 black Germans also went to the camps. In Berlin. Hmm? In Berlin. In Berlin, yeah. I know. There's a book. You got a frequent black bookstore. Oh, right. This is Oregon. <laughs> I grew up with black bookstores in L.A., so, yeah, there's, you know, uh, I, it, I do have it on the book list. Can I give you the book list? It's in there. Okay, it's in there. All right. Non-whites and non-Aryans, those whose rights can be terminated, kind of like the Indians being terminated. <laughs> PCs. All right. The original Lone Ranger and Tonto, not the upcoming Army Hammer and uh, Johnny Depp movie. The original one. Okay? This is, this is a picture of that. So, the Lone Ranger and Tonto. So, the storyline behind the Lone Ranger... He's a, he was, uh, survived a massacre by uh, white bandits, he was a Texas Ranger, and he was rescued by this Apache warrior, Tonto. Now, the Apaches, not actually their real name, just what they've been called by folks, the Apaches were enemies of the Spanish. And um, Sp uh, Tonto in Spanish means... 
sword? No. That's, that's in Japanese, and it's spelled differently. It means dumb or stupid. Okay? So only in Hollywood would an Apache call himself dumb or stupid in the language of the enemy and have it stick. What did Tonto call the Lone Ranger? Ke'e Mosabe. See, Jay Silverheels is uh, actually from a native from Canada, but he's playing an Apache. So Ke'e Mosabe in Apache means child of a dog or son of a. There you go. There's an old joke. Storyline, the model minority sacrifices themselves or their people to serve whites. Story, Tonto and Apache rescues a lone ranger. They become partners. Tonto. So, actually, Jay Silverheels was Potawatomi. Kimosabi which a lot of people think means trusted friends, ke'e mosabe, child of a dog or son of a bitch, right? So, there's this old joke. Lone Ranger and Tonto were surrounded. Tonto says, Tonto, we're surrounded by Indians. Tonto goes, what do you mean we, white man? So, Pearl Harbor. Remember 9-11. Recall when... All right, and what they said at 9-11, remember when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor? Uh-huh. Yeah. What do you mean, we, white man? Did the Hawaiians ask you to depose their monarchy in 1893 to protect them from Japanese tyranny? No, they did not. Okay? For a number of centuries. Centuries. Hawaiians first came to, the Polynesians first came to those islands 5,000 years ago. For a number of centuries, Hawaii was a sovereign nation. Recognized here, recognized in Europe. In fact, they started wearing European-style clothing with their monarchy because they're dealing with heads of state in Europe. Because it's not really just appropriate weather for the dress. This is the last Hawaiian queen. Lilio Kalani, yes. Right? The so-called Sandwich Islands were not uninhabited. They were called that by the British. The Earl of Sandwich, who invented the sandwich. In the late 19th century, a monarchy recognized by European and American powers. Not that they actually thought of the Hawaiians as equals, but simply because they needed a strategic port. All right, so the Hawaiian Islands are one of the farthest places on the planet you can get from a continent. So in the middle of the ocean, it becomes strategic. So what's, one of the things that's going on, the reason you have a Hawaiian connection in Oregon, where you have, whenever you see... Here in Oregon is a place name. There are Hawaiians there. Now, actually how they pronounce it, W is pronounced V, Hawaii. But Hawaii, in English, kind of phonetic. So part of what was going on, what, what is Oregon called? The nickname? Oregon. <laughs> the Beaver State. <laughs> Why? 
And why are beavers important? They make dams, yes, that's what they do. <laughs> Why? <laughs> that's, hey. For their fur. For their fur. What are people doing with their her fur? Wearing it. Wearing it? Making hats. Making hats. Fashion. Felt, fashion. Where are beaver hats popular? England. England? Where else? East. Where has England colonized? Where do Europeans also colonize or do trade? New Zealand, Australia, where else? Think Asia. Think really big, humongous, ancient China. 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 Word. Beaver hats were all the rage, not only in China, but also Europe, as you pointed out. So, how are we going to get our beaver pelts to China? Through Hawaii, right? But what happens in the winter? Too cold. No, not, not so much too cold. It floods. Winter storms. And the Pacific is known for its pretty Deadly. huge winter storms. Certainly favored by surfers in Oahu, North Shore. <laughs> Big 60 to 100 foot swells. But if you're not a surfer, you don't want to be caught in a Pacific storm <laughs> in the middle of the ocean. So, where are you going to chill if you're a boat captain? Stay in Hawaii. Stay in Hawaii, right? Where you meet the friendly natives, and the friendly native says, where are you going? We're going to Oregon. We could get jobs for your people there. So, actually, what in a form of indentured servitude, they're not exactly slaves because their services are being paid for but not directly to them they're getting room and board so the hawaiians were basically involved in construction in logging and agriculture in all the places that you know you see hawaii hawaii creek here in oregon that's where they traditionally were is that why there's no uh out of state uh tuition correct because of that long-standing connection all right part of it is that, all right? So, strategic port. Hawaii is a strategic port. Way before the fledgling United States existed, all right? So, for years, whaling ships, fur traders overwintered in Hawaii. And this is what brought Hawaiians to Oregon in the early 19th century. So last reign, she was the last reigning monarch. So some Hawaiian royalty were outspoken about the dangers of allowing foreign business and military interests increasing their influence in the islands. Almost prophetic. The U.S. in particular succeeded in passing constitution that prevented most Hawaiians from having a vote and gave foreign, read white, residents voting power. So imagine this, in terms of the model of like nation building in Iraq and creating a constitution. That takes some um, cajones. Take over a sovereign nation, write a constitution so that the residents of that land can't even vote in their own country. But Dole Pineapple gets to. Okay? So under international law, so a revolution, that is a revolution backed by business and military interests, forced her to give up her throne and a provisional government was established. Now, here's what happens according to international law. And this is why birthers are right about Obama. Under U.S., not under international law, Hawaii is not part of the United States. Hawaii was part of an illegal military invasion and occupation. Under international law, 
if you are invaded and you fight back and you lose, tough luck, Charlie. But if you are invaded and you don't fight back, the occupation is illegal. She instructed her followers not to fight back. Knowing this. Okay? Imprisoned in her own palace. Right? So that's why there's a Hawaiian sovereignty movement today where they're basically saying, yeah, we are still, <laughs> we didn't give up. We are just occupied. We weren't a state when this happened. Y'all just illegally occupied us. Now, the problem is, of course, who's going to fight the United States for Hawaii? Nobody. Does that make it legal? No. It's an illegal occupation, so Obama being born there under international law, well, yeah. He's not actually a U.S. citizen because Hawaii is not actually a state. Try and argue that in the United Nations. Okay? So it's only Native Hawaiians are basically no. We, yeah, we're proud to be American, kind of. Whatever president uh, was in power didn't want the Hawaiian Islands to be taken over, but his generals wasn't willing to give it up. Right. Strategic, militarily strategic port. Yeah, general said you have to take us out. Yeah. Basically, that wasn't Okay, so Hawaii was, the term is annexed to the United States two years later, but did not become a state until after World War II. Okay, so technically, <coughs> December 7th, 1941, we were attacked. Uh, what we are you talking about? Which we is that? Place where people can't even vote in their own homeland? Hmm. That we? Dole Pineapple? That we? U.S. Navy? That we? Hmm. So she was also a songwriter. One of the more popular songs, Aloha Oi. So, Hawaiian sovereignty, of course, is very much an issue today. How did, how did she become so submissive? I mean, was she paid uh, No, she wasn't paid off at all. I was curious. No, she's basically, uh, actually, I think, and I'm, it might even be in a slide, so usually I don't, let's see if it's here. Ah, <laughs> so notice the URL. Naval history. Yeah, naval history. Right? So, this is probably one of the few times you'll see me cite a military history. You know, it's not just simply that the winners of a particular history is written by the winners. Right? So, hero is the teller of the tale. When Queen Lilio Kalani was dethroned in the Palace Revolution of 1893, the military influence of the USS Boston, Honolulu Harbor, ensured its success. In 1895, when the Royalists attempted a counter-revolution in American warships' presence, the USS Philadelphia dampened the possibility for success. Yeah, battleship? Sure. The provisional government under Sanford Dole made the final appeal for annexation when the military necessity of the islands became apparent. Okay, so this is the Navy saying, hey, yeah, we took it over, and our ships played a critical role. Provisional government. That provisional government, right, so they're talking about a revolution dethroning a sovereign power, and they're not even ashamed or hiding this. Well, how many times did they do that? I mean, the U.S. support a coup that, Indeed. That, that represented our interests. Right. They've done that a lot, right? So, the provisional government under Sanford Dole made the final appeal for annexation when the military necessity of the islands became apparent. So, Hawaiians are not allowed to vote in the annexation because the Constitution excludes them voting. 
extension of European imperialism. Indeed. In 1898, as the U.S. attempted to transport troops, livestock, and equipment to the Philippines, the importance of the island as a depot or reshipping point became obvious. Annexation was approved, and on 18, 9, 12 August 1898, the U.S. flag was run up over the palace. Downtown Honolulu. Iolani Palace. Iolani Palace. Isn't that used in Hawaii Five O or something like that? Yeah. So, this is kind of like the legacy of the white man's burden. An American democracy which grants <coughs> freedom if you're, on the, if you're the right color or can pay the right place. The dole, which is dole pineapple, CNH sugar, that's California and Hawaii sugar, and other business interests which dominated Hawaiian politics, importing workers from different countries so they couldn't organize into unions, so they developed a common language, pigeon. Hawaiians and others in the sugarcane fields were whipped as if it were slavery into the 20th century. Slavery had been abolished everywhere else. In Hawaii, people were being whipped and put in chains and worked. Oh, that's right. It's not part of the United States. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. So... Apparently not in Hawaii. Another benefit of the gift of American civilization, which I'm sure they're going to call me a communist for saying that, but I have never, like Rob Robeson, been a member of the Communist Party. So the reason we're jumping back here, clan Nazi vibrations. While the theater owner McDonald name does not appear in the KKK membership list from the 20s, he did allow Klan-friendly movies in his theater. A theater which, if it didn't have a peanut gallery or nigger heaven, followed the segregated policies of many businesses on Willamette Street, including Seymour's, which is now Actors Cabaret, J.J. Newberry, which is the DAC Child Care, and Woolworths, which is actually not a hole anymore. I think they're building it up. Uh, all those long... So when you're talking about the civil rights struggle where people were having sit-in demonstrations, integrating lunch counters, Newberries and Woolworths here were part of that segregation piece too. Right? The theater was also featured in the forced relocation of Japanese-American citizens in Eugene, so the historical record says uh, three to five of them, and uh, they were you know, placed there and then uh, marched up the street to the train station where they were loaded onto the same cattle cars that uh, Mark Hatfield's friends were in Salem. Trains were running down, and then... Now it's owned by the Springfield Creamery. Yeah. Run by kids. Right. I don't think they think they don't. No, they're generally cool. Yeah, they're cool. He knows. He knows. Yeah. He knows everything. You're, you're good with Eugene history. Had to learn it for self-defense. Yeah. All right. So, World War II, Japanese internees. So, Chinese were specifically excluded in the Oregon Constitution. The Japanese were not. The Western world was opening up to trade with Japan. So, for example, in one instance, uh, as we talked about last week or two, the Toledo incident, so work, Japanese workers were actually recruited to work in the lo lo logging industry because the white owner felt that whites were too lazy to pull greed chain. Group of white townspeople forcibly removed the Japanese to Corvallis. So anyway, in any case, Japanese Americans were born and lived in Oregon, which by constitutional law meant them they were citizens. So some whites objected to the possibility that Japanese Americans might be investing in Japanese war bonds. No one seemed to object to prominent white Americans investing heavily in Nazi Germany. And by the way, the Japanese weren't investing in Japanese war bonds. 
So after Pearl Harbor, the internment orders were given. Assembly Point was the High Lake Theater, now the Health Center, which is why the internment memorial was built there. So only three Japanese Americans registered in Lane County. Shie Airai, Woodrow Ichihashi, and Hitoshi Watanabe. That's in the, as far as the historical record is concerned. There are 176 in Marion County, several who are friends of Mark, of Mark Hatfield. Largest number were in Multnomah and Hood River. So all told from Oregon, according to the historical record, about 3,400 were sent to relocation camps. Is Hood River, a, Hood River there's a lot of poly in Hood River too. Yeah. I was curious why, because Hood River seems like middle of nowhere kind of yeah good for agriculture the well with the pears I guess yeah so the Eugene City Council passed a resolution urging compliance U of O professor was able to get passage out of state for 20 Japanese American students so they could finish their education so here's another thing you might want to pay attention to on the final Presidential Executive Orders. So if you remember from high school, those of you who went to American high school, well, for those of you who didn't, we have separation of powers in terms of the political structure of the United States. Congress, both houses of Congress, so the House of Representatives and the Senate, make laws which the executive branch, the president, executes those laws. And the Supreme Court, the judicial branch, interprets those laws, right? So the judicial branch the, of which the highest court is the Supreme Court, right? <laughs> Separation of powers. Now, in order sometimes to execute some of the laws, the president is empowered to do executive orders. So it has to be legal, there has to be some basis, which is why frequently the President of the United States is a lawyer, does help in executing the law, right? But because we have a reactive system that is, unless people protest, or a corporation pays you to do something, you ain't gonna do nothing. So this executive order, to integrate the war industries came about from the first March on Washington, which actually didn't happen. Okay, so the idea was, okay, we're going to war. That means we're gearing up. There's jobs to make war-related stuff. Who gonna get them jobs? Well, that, you're right, it was white people only. But wait, not all of us are white, not all of us are men. Rosie the Riveter wants in on building the ships, etc., etc. Right? So we're integrating women, we're integrating non-whites. So A. Philip Randolph and a group of other folks come to the president and say, you will sign an order to integrate the war industries, or we will march on Washington and show the world that you are discriminating. 100,000 people made it to DC. Roosevelt signed. Yeah. <laughs> so the march actually didn't happen, but the people were there. All right? 9066. Executive Order 9066, Japanese internment. And 9095 establishes the alien property custodian. Now what's always fun, especially when I was doing the initial research, of this, and there's a reason why I wanted to bring up this, 
you try and find references to the alien property custodian and that executive order, it ain't easy. At one point, they were saying, oh, well, this is part of President Roosevelt's personal papers, and you have to physically go to Hyde Park. To wait, wait, stop. Executive order, right? It should be a public document, searchable online, uh, like the other ones. How come I can't get this? It's not in the Freedom of Information. Hmm, shouldn't be. It's history, right? Just like the Klan list. <laughs> Okay, so here's what 9095 does. 9095 allows the U.S. government to confiscate foreign assets of joint American-German business ventures, but allows the American side of those ventures to continue to operate untouched. Interesting piece of legislation, this, and this is why I say then, you know, the Union Bank, among others, is, is operating with the full knowledge of the president, because the president did an executive order. So here's what's deep about this, yeah. okay? We're at war with Germany. Major American corporations are trading with Nazi Germany. It's one of the reasons I well, it, they did touch, they did touch them, okay? So American and German sides of the corporation, we can compensate, confiscate the German side, but the American side remains untouched, which means the company's still in fact operating. Okay? So, those businesses included IBM, Ford Motors, General Motors, ITT Siemens, DuPont, Standard Oil of New Jersey, which is basically Chevron, Davis Oil Company, Union Bank, a host of others, but IBM, basically built the primitive computer system that enabled Hitler to round up the Jews. How do you round up six million Jews in Germany? Well, they have addresses, they pay taxes, they're census. How do you coordinate, how do you crunch those numbers? Computers. IBM put that together. IBM also basically gave the South African government the information systems to create the apartheid state as well. This is why all my computers have been Apple gear. Sorry, put your money where, <laughs> unfortunately I do have to bank a chase. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But sooner, and Ford, well I've only bought one Ford. But Henry Ford wrote a book called The International Jew, but it was not for this reason that he won the highest civilian war Nazi Germany could give to a non-German. Hitler also built, I mean Ford also built cars and military vehicles for the Nazis. Because remember, he had pioneered uh, mass production. Hmm. Uh, ITT Siemens, ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph. They're an electronics company, and Siemens, an electronic company, makes cell phones today. Then, they were building altitude bomb fuses for Nazi bombs, and they put together the German telephone system during wartime. So I'm just saying, corporations do not have to be bound by patriotism. Their loyalty is to profit, not people. That's why in terms of looking at what they do today, their alliance is not to the United States, even if they started in the United States. And for some of them, 
they will do business with either side. Right? Highest of anything order. Well, as soon as that war started, weren't they uh, required to cease and desist? Ah, well, here's how, here, we'll get to that. No, they were not required to cease and desist. So let me tell you this before we get to this. Okay, so here's what happens. With we'll take, for example, Union Bank. Once that executive order was signed, they basically confisc the government confiscated the German side, but paid Herbert Walker and Prescott Bush seven hundred and fifty thousand for their shares each. So one point one and a half million dollars. This is in nineteen forty dollars. Yeah, today's dollars would be more, but in those dollars, 750000 for their shares. So Prescott had one share. So, I mean, when you think about how much does it cost to capitalize a bank and one and a half million in $1940, okay? And that was for their share of the German side of the bank. Huh. This is a replica, replica of the actual poster. Western Defense Command and Fourth Army, Wartime Civil Control Administration, Presidio of San Francisco. Instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry living in the following area, all the counties of Lane, Douglas, Coos, Curry, Josephine, Jackson, and all that portion of the county, Klamath, State of Oregon, lying west of Hi Highway 97. No Japanese person will be permitted to move into or out of the above area after 5 o'clock without attaining special permission from the representative of the command. So, and they're supposed to gather at 34 West 6th Avenue. Okay, which is, yeah, if you understand how East West works in Eugene, Everything to the west of Willamette, start, Willamette starts at zero. So that's basically the Hulk Center. Yeah. Well, that used to be the Eugene Army. Yeah, among other things. And the... Uh, so, such permits will only be granted for uniting members of a family. Following instru instructions must be observed. Responsible member of each family, preferably the head of the family or the person whose name the property is held, and each live, individual living alone will report to either the civil control station. This must be done between 8 and 5. Evacuees must carry with them on departure from the reception center of the following property. Bedding and linens, no mattress, for each member of the family. Toilet articles for each member of the family. Extra clothing for each member of the family. Essential personal effects for each member of the family. Now remember, they're, they're not allowed to carry these in their vehicles. You have to carry all this stuff <coughs> in your hands. No pets. No personal items. The United States, through its agencies, will provide for the storage, the sole risk of a non -resident, of no residential substantial household items, such as washing machines, pianos, heavy cooking utensils, essentially they lost all their stuff. Their property was seized. Now, the only reason I point this out now is that the legal precedent for doing this has never been rescinded. Okay, so still basically the enabling legislation is on the books for them to round up anybody and put them in the same camp, some of which have been historically preserved, or other camps, which we may or may not know where they are, on the basis of race or any other reason that they decide. And they got, what, it's about 20 years ago, they got paid $20,000 a piece for this. 
right. uh, which is only there, a business for the reparations. Yes, there is, there is uh, reparation. There has been reparation, certainly. So not only a planned memorial, but it actually happened. So let's look at Pearl Harbor. So almost 150,000 blacks served in the Navy during World War II in 1941. Dory Miller, a mess man aboard the US Arizona, portrayed in the movies by, among others, Cuba Gooding, was awarded, uh, let's see, it was in, uh, what was it, Pearl Harbor? There's that movie with Ben Affleck, was it Ben Affleck? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, was awarded the Navy Cross for shooting down four enemy airplanes during the attack in Pearl Harbor. Now, he was a mess man. What that means is black people enlisted in the Army, Navy, the armed services to fight. But they didn't want to trust us with guns. Though part of, that might have been part of our training. Okay? So we were basically in the height of, not the height, <laughs> not that there isn't white supremacy today, but back then we were hired to serve whites. So in as cooks. So he enlisted to fight, not serve white officers as a waiter. So after his medal, so he basically shot down four enemy planes during the attack. And then after he won this medal that he's pictured with, he was sent on a national recruitment tour to enlist more blacks in the armed services. His next assignment after that tour was a cook and his ship was torpedoed and lost with all hands in 1944. This is what we do with heroes. So first march in Washington. So part of that, so Dory Miller gives you that idea in terms of looking at how folks are being treated when they want to serve their country. So I actually told you this already. So fearing the reaction of the national world press, Roosevelt signed the executive order the day before the march was to have taken place. Port Chicago Mutiny. So, in 42, those of you who are um, native to the San Francisco Bay Area, Port Chicago was on the bay. It was a naval ammunition base located 30 miles northeast of San Francisco for the loading and shipping of ammunition to the United States to U.S. troops fighting the Japanese in the Pacific. Uh, if you saw the movie Battleship, I'm just making references to popular culture, right? These shells. They're, they're heavy, definitely. So imagine, well, I'll, I'll just show you, right? These are the shells. I don't know if you know that area, the Bay Area, but in the summertime, it's hot, okay? You can notice this is full sunlight, which is something we may not experience in Oregon a whole lot, but there is hot. So, all the sailors loading the munitions were black and the officers commanding them and overseeing the loading were white. Meals and quarters were segregated with all whites eating first, then blacks. No training had been given to the loaders or the officer, officer supervising them. Navy didn't even have written guidelines for loading munitions. Now, remember, these are live. Drop on the wrong way, boom. They are not given gloves. It's hot. Metal shell, hot sun, no gloves. Hmm. Okay, lack of official training meant the men had to learn on the job without gloves or other safety precautions, with white officers betting on whose crew could finish fastest. And you have to follow orders. This is a disaster waiting to happen, obviously. Okay, so improper handling of volatile explosives, that is rolling live shells down gangways to be caught with bare hands 
and of course, eventually, disaster. This is one of the ships they were being loaded onto. If you ever take the Coast Starlight, that is the Amtrak Choo Choo, down to Oakland, it passes these Liberty ships. Basically, those ships that are at anchor uh, date back to World War II. This is like one of those. Okay, 10 p.m. Two munition ships, the E.A. Bryant and Quinault Victory, blew up while being loaded with bomb shells and depth charges. Two terrific explosions rocked the base. However, it <coughs> happened. One ship set, set off the other. So this is an iron vessel, probably the size of this building easily. It was vaporized from the explosion. Vaporized. Okay, non-nuclear munitions vaporized from the explosion. Okay, five kilotons of roughly TNT, of TNT, roughly the same order of magnitude as the atomic bomb. Everyone on the pier on board two ships were killed. 320 men, two of, 200 of whom were black, another 390 military personnel and civilians were injured, including 202 black enlisted men. Okay, biggest home front disaster in World War II, and 15% uh, of all black casualties sustained during the war happened there, in peacetime. Catastrophe on the home front. The next day, many of the black sailors searched the wreckage for bodies. Many of the victims could not be identified. Right, if the ships were gone, how are you going to identify a body? Carnage was indescribable. Shortly after the disaster, Navy Court of Inquiry cleared all white officers of responsibility in the disaster. The court did place blame on the black loaders, saying rough handling of munitions by individual or individuals may have caused the explosion. This conclusion did not take into account the lack of training. Traumatized by the horrible explosion and the aftermath, 258 ammunition loaders, all of whom were black, refused to return to work, considered too dangerous for white sailors. They were interned on a barge until they went to work. 50 of them still refused. Because the issue was, look, we don't mind loading, but how about gloves? How about training? Protocol. How about something? Protocol. Not just following orders, like, yeah. So, mutiny. 50 seamen who refused to work, turn to work, and were court-martialed, court convicted of mutiny, and imprisoned till the end of the war, racially divided America, World War II, their plight at rage, outraged blacks and white liberals, including a young NAACP <coughs> lawyer named of Thurgood Marshall. Marshall was president of the trial, and he voiced the frustration and anger of the men on trial. He said, this is not 50 men on trial for mutiny. This is the Navy on trial for its whole vicious policy towards Negroes. Negroes in the Navy don't mind loading ammunition. They just want to know why they're the only ones doing the loading. They want to know why they're segregated. Some example. Good questions. But you're uppity for asking them. So after that... <laughs> After the war, with the help of the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall's persistence, the sentences of the, of the sailors were slightly reduced, but not overturned. Ultimately, the action of the sailors changed the face of the Navy. Soon white sailors were put to work side by side with black sailors loading ammunition. Again, in part to, to Marshall's intervention, the Navy began a systematic policy of desegregation under uh, Secretary of the Navy Forrestal. In 1948, when Truman signed Executive Order 9981, ordering an end to racial segregation in the U.S. Armed Forces, the Navy was already theoretically in compliance. A little bit. 
more than 50 years. The conviction still stood, but I think that Clinton pardoned them. Is one of his acts going out of office. It's Husky Gearman. They've made movies of this. So racial exclusionary policies were well in existence for certain areas of the military during the late 30s and 40s. General Arnold made it clear no blacks would ever pilot a plane in the upcoming war. The U.S. was mobilizing for a possible war against the United Front of the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan. The legal segregation of African Americans did not allow them to receive the necessary training to become fighter air pilots at white-operated pilot schools. After some protests, the War Department in 41 agreed to accommodate an all-black flight school at Tuskegee Air Force Base. So I don't know if any of you have ever enlisted in the military, since it's an all-volunteer force. This was a drafted force. Uh, one of the things that may or may not have been apparent if in watching either version of the Tuskegee Airmen movies, the, either the HBO one or the other one, Red Tails, all these black pilots receive their training either in Canada or overseas. Not only did they have pilot's licenses, but they were all college educated. All of them. So in that sense, they were overqualified to be army pilots compared to white pilots. Okay? Here you have a general basically saying, oh, well, they're genetically inferior. They can't fly combat aircraft. So that would be a significant barrier. So that base produced the first African-American combat fighter pilots and they became known as the Tuskegee Airmen, the 99th Pursuit Squadrons. Out of this squadron came Colonel Ben Davis, son of the first African-American general, Ben Davis Sr. Colonel Davis was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in combat later promoted to general in 1965. The airmen were trained and reluctantly sent to North Africa after the intercession of the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, which was depicted in the film with Lawrence Fishburne. And they were assigned to bomber escort. They did not lose a single bomber to enemy fighters, though course, when they got an award later, somebody said, oh, they lost a bomber. Okay, a bomber. Okay, two bombers. What? What's this about? Why even raise this? So if you uh, access this in PDF, what you'll see, the original Black Panthers, So the all-black 61st Tank Battalion was assigned to the 26th Infantry Division of the 12th Corps and General Patton's 3rd Army. He specifically requested the 761st because of their record. So all-black tank division. Usually, uh, basically, they fought for 183 days, that is six months of continuous combat. Usually you're rotated out after a month or so. They fought for six. So, you know, that equation about twice as good to be considered equal, sometimes you have to do six times as much. These are the folks that also liberated uh, the camps, the death camps. Is Patton giving a medal. Now, interestingly enough, this they aren't depicted in the movie Patton at all. Two minutes, thank you. All right. Eleven silver stars, sixty-nine bronze stars, three certificates of merit, and two hundred and ninety-six purple hearts. All right. We'll stop here and um, 
review for the final, and I'll have your papers back then when I remember to bring them. Gracias.